Okay, guys, uh, Ross Polo, I'm the Vice President of the Philly Chapter. Welcome to today's meeting. Um, for this presentation, Ed Sayerlin is a new chapter member, um, longtime model railroader. Um, he's going to introduce himself in a minute. Um, he recently uh, joined the chapter and he's like, hey, I'd like to present. So, boom, we got him. And we appreciate it very much because uh, we work, and this is a PRR specific. Uh, locomotive that he's going to be talking about so it fits right in to the criteria so we're, we're thankful that he's here today so i'm going to turn it over to ed um, what we wanted to do today is he does have a powerpoint presentation but a lot of this is going to be his discussion so what instead of projecting the powerpoint over the zoom we're just going to use the webcam so we can see the screen and also see ed and he has some models that he's going to show us so we'll work we'll work through it well, good morning, gentlemen. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Um, like I joined the chapter, I got involved, well, about a year ago, I joined the Pennsylvania Railroad chapter, and then I learned about your individual chapter down here, and I do some work in the area, and I'm like, well, that'd be fun, and then saw some of your publications, and I'm like, wow, that's pretty cool. So uh, I joined, and then um, in my application, I put down... Um, like the model. So Russ reached down and said, what are you doing? So here I am. So hopefully it's something that, uh, uh, hopefully there's something out of it. And uh, I enjoy doing this and hopefully uh, ideas can be shared and we can talk and go further. I do have to say one thing. I do believe my mom, hi mom, he's watching from Florida. Hi dad. So hopefully you're there and hopefully, <laughs> hopefully uh, it sounds, uh, looks good. So um, I got, I got a uh, PowerPoint. So Let's talk about brass. brass. Brass locomotives. They were incredibly popular back in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, and up to the 90s. So what is brass? Well, there's an attraction to brass that goes way back to the you know, prehistoric time. Uh, prehistoric times, brass has been used. It's, a, it's, a, it's an alloy of copper and zinc. Portions vary. You learn that the hard way when you're trying to solder. <laughs> um, and... Uh, you know, something that's been around obviously for a long, long time. So, hand built brass has been imported in large quantities from 58 to 90. Relatively expensive for the day. Unfortunately, with the improvements of injection molding and a lot of things going on, the newer technologies, it's pretty much wiped out the brass market. Anything out there today is incredibly expensive. I mean, you can find something that's Four thousand dollars, which is just crazy. Um, you know, obviously Broadway Limited has kind of really hurt. You know, gone into that, and their models are beautiful. Um, but today, it just has affected the market. Um, what was the appeal of older brass locomotives? They're hand built, small um, production runs, and the variations. So, if you're out there looking, if you're going to a show. You know, we've been to plenty of shows like that. You have your brass handbook. I don't know if anyone's familiar with the brown brass handbook. Uh, it's been out for a while. I'm not sure the last one. I used one that's from 1992. It means there's a lot of information out there. You can buy this stuff. If you're a smart buyer, you can find stuff very expensive. For example, uh, there was an auction out of Indiana this summer uh, called Scouts, which is really heavily involved in the classic toy train world, but they had um, they had a collection of brass, and regardless of the size of the locomotive, Mountain, Shea, Pacific, Atlantic, it all went for the same price, and you could have bought them for under $200 a piece. And I picked up a couple pieces, where one was a mountain and one was a heavy Pacific, unpainted. Uh, the unpainted stuff goes very expensive. Painted, if it's done well, goes for a lot more, for sure. So I look at, you know, I, I run a, you know, I'm involved in a uh, distribution company. So I'm, I'm programmed to look for value. And I see value there. I see beautiful models that were bought by someone at one time and stored and sat for 20, 30 years in someone's closet or whatever. They're coming out. And these models, you'll never, they'll never make these models again. And probably some of the variations will never be made by the mass producers because they just have to make money. I mean, they want to make a lot of models, keep their production costs down, 
and so so they're going to go for the high flow. They're going to do the Hudsons and the you know the the big boys. You know, are they going to do a, a you know an M one B or an M one A? Probably not. You know, so for a modeler, there is a lot of there's some really good information, some really good subjects to work on, and and there's so much documentation. There's so much out there. You know, I come from the world of scale modeling. You know, guys love modeling, you know, World War I airplanes and World War II airplanes. And they're working on black and white photos. World West, and particularly so in the railroad, with all the documentation that's been done out there over the years and all the color photography. You can you can you want a model or a Trump subject, and you can have some phenomenal material to work with. And we'll talk about that. So So, you know, we haven't had one of these days lately, thank God. But when it looked like this, get out a model, go to your basement, and let's resurrect an old model and make it run on a modern day route. And that's relatively easy. Really talking about upgrading the, uh, the motor, putting a DCC in, you want to get fan through the lights, you know, then you got to tweak it, you got to look at, you know, your, your clearance on the drivers, make sure the drivers are good, quartering them. Um, which can be a very big challenge. I mean, you can go down many rabbit holes, okay? Fortunately, this model wasn't that bad. Um, so, <clears throat> so what I start doing is I tear it down. You tear it out, you look at it, you inspect it. Uh, this model I bought at probably about four years ago at a TCA meet in North Pennsylvania, which is a heavily big uh, toy train meet. Guy had a bunch of grass there. A lot of guys go in that show and they buy collections. And they're buying no scale, they're buying S scale. And sometimes you, you find tables that have this stuff. It was inexpensive. And, uh, you know, you, you, you take a, a, a leap of faith on it for sure. So I got it back in my shop, you carry it into it, you, uh, you measure it up, and you kind of figure out, you take a, you take a game plan from there. One of the big things you got to do is you got to document. You got to make sure. Every piece, you know what you're doing because there's no instructions. <laughs> so when you take it off, you gotta make sure that screw goes there. If this was insulated, uh, make sure your wheels, your insulation, a lot of problems come that guys will flip the wheels so the polarity is all off and that can be a real You really gotta study which one is the, is the insulated side of the train. So um, yeah, so you're gonna tear out the motor. You know, your old open motors are not really feasible in today's world particularly with the DCC, they cause a lot of problems and so forth. So you really want to kind of sit down, you really got to pay attention to your carry to. You want to store everything. You got to buy little bins, because you got a lot of little parts. And I separate them. If, you know, if I know it's for the drivers, I put them the drivers. If you know it's coming from the cab, I know I put in the cab. So I try to keep everything separate. Because again, there's no instructions. Thank God the cell phone, and you can document very well with your cell phone. So you want to take out, you know, take out the motor, you want to do the DCC, you want to do the sound, you can go from there. Um, I'm not doing a plug here, but uh, I'm not, if you're familiar with Northwest Short Line, they are a phenomenal source. They pretty much make everything you need to tackle this project. They make the little electric motors, they make springs, they make uh, tools, ordering tools, gear pulls, they have it all. And uh, there's shops out there that have it or you can find it online and they make it really easy. So it really makes it fun looking at their information, going through and pretty much figuring it out. They make the little drive line tubes. Like when you see a picture here, this had a relatively hard drive line. Um, you have a shaft. So take that out and we use it. And I'll show you have a little rubber, like almost look like a fuel line hose, you know, like an injection hose. It's really much harder, and that works out very well. But you know, when you pay attention to detail, the big picture takes care of itself. You know, get your references. I really enjoy laying out pictures, like Don Ball Jr.'s book that I've had uh, 50 plus years. Um, this is just a wealth of knowledge. I'm sure you all guys have this book, but the photography is just amazing. If you look at the detail, you can really pick up a lot of neat little things. How the engine weathered, you know, condensation on the tube was really neat. 
come to Book of Account. Stand in front of So this is the book I was referencing to. I think this came out in the late 80s and uh, just a wonderful reference. Um, I'm not sure if this gentleman's still alive, but his work is, you know, is done. And uh, his work is just wonderful. And uh, so, you know, there's always, and then you can go, besides with the library, the internet, obviously. There's so much out there. Like, I was just growing up, uh, one day I was just messing around for about five minutes. I was thinking about weathering the steam engine. You know, it's a natural thing. You know, every steam engine is going to weather relatively the same way. Okay. So I found this. It talks about the colors and what can happen. And it just, you know, this was free. And this right here probably saved, you know, when you start really tackling weathering on it, then save it by two hours. Just follow that and you're going to be right in. You know, it's going to look relatively good. It's going to look right in line to what it would look like on the main line in 1945 or whatever. So. One of the hardest things was, and I've learned, I'm still learning, this is my actually my first year doing this, is soldering brass. That is a challenge. And I hear people talk about um, resistant soldering, and uh, here, head shake, you see head shaking back there. And I've looked into it, but they are so expensive. I mean, and I only find one source, and they're like over $400. So I think, Lord, I think it'll try to become a better soldering. Uh, because I have a nice little soldering. So I've kind of done a lot of research here recently about silver soldering, flux you use, and, and I'll be honest, I'm having a terrible time with the headlight. Um, I've tried it multiple times. Uh, what I've done, I took it off. I went to the, I want to put the light in. I used the Atlas, the really nice little LED lights. I mean, the things are little squares and they fit perfectly in, in the back of the canister. And then, you know, you build your lens, which I'll talk about a little later. Um, so that's a challenge right there is before you get into this or learn as you go, the soldering can be a little challenge because talking to people, going online, um, the resistance soldering helps because you can put it together without causing it to overheat and in fact, other soldering joints on the model itself. And if anybody has anything to say in that, please speak up. The, the only other thing I would add is from my own experience, whether it was just the soldering or otherwise, if I'm soldering major assemblies, so like soldering a cab or soldering part of the boiler together, soldering running boards to the boiler, I will use silver solder because it's a higher temperature solder. And I mean, I've, I've stripped locomotives down to the point where I'm replacing running boards. I'm adding in like power reverse. So I had to, modify the running board for that things like that a lot of times it does end up affecting other joints i will use silver solder for the major joints and then start using progressively lower temperature solders that again these are all looking up information online stuff that's freely available that other people recommended that were had worked well for them for locomotives that they're still running 15 20 and, and more years later so, um, you know, and then the smaller details, like your headlight, things like that, you don't necessarily want to use a high temperature solder because you are in a greater danger of affecting all those other solder joints, or at least any other slow supply. Right there. That's perfect. I mean, that's worth my time right there, going to talk to this gentleman right here. Um, that's the beauty of our hobby, that sharing with knowledge. I, I mean, so thank you so much on that. And uh, so uh, having a strategy, I mean, it's funny because you know, I never thought of because in, in scale modeling, there will be the you know strategy and you're going to glue something together. What glues you use? You use a CA glue, you use a super glue, you use whatever. And so now I've just learned that there is a soldering strategy. There's different solders for different tasks. So thank you. So um, so I, one thing I'd like to do is uh, I tear down. This a little bit of this comes from my industry. I'm involved in remanufacturing of truck parts or transmissions and such. So. I see this on a daily basis in my office or my off in my company. So I tear into it, put into a parts bin, clean an ultrasonic cleaner, bought one on Amazon, worked out really well. And uh, you just kind of go through and just clean everything out. Now, you got to be a little careful. You have some plastic on those brake pads, the um, brake um, levers there and the pads. You got to be careful on that. You can overheat a little bit. So I had to be a little careful on that, not melt that because that is plastic. So. 
Once I got it cleaned and made sure it was dry, I started doing fine rest. My strategy was to do start from the bottom up. You know, I, love, I talked to a lot of people or looked, listened to a lot of people say they just did spray paint it with the wheels on and then go in there and just kind of do it. I didn't like that strategy. I really want to kind of get behind it. I don't want to throw a lot of paint at the project. So I tore into it, tore it apart, got to the bare chassis. This is my good uh, people. And I started experimenting with primers. And I don't know, Mr. Hobby is a very popular Japanese paint line. Um, you can find it in relatively, relatively there's a few stores in the country that have it. Uh, up in the Northeast, there's a few that have it. Some, you can get it um, online for sure. But they make an aqueous line and they make an enamel hybrid line. Their enamel line is by far the best paint available for hybrids. You'll hear to me a mix good stuff and it is good. I'm not a big fan of the uh, acrylic lines. I've always had problems with it, causing problems with my airbrush. What's nice about Mr. Hobby or Gunsay, another name of there, is they have a full product. They have a lacquer there that is, it, it's really unicorn, uh, unicorn mixture. It does an amazing job. You can cut it with any other, I cut it with Flopa, I cut it with Scale Cut. It's a very hot lacquer thinner, it's a leveling thinner, so it really kind of spreads it out very nice. And you literally, with, even with their fine, you get a very nice finish, which I have an example of. It was also nice that they had grades. This is the 15, this is a really fine grade. You can go to a lower number or a thicker grade. So if you're like trying to fill a seam on a model, it would kind of give you that final seam filler and kind of make a nice smooth finish. You work on a car or try to get rid of a seam on a fuselage or an airplane. But this being 1500, I, I my decision was go 1500 because you know it's a 187 scale model. You have a lot of detail. So that worked out wonderful. I wasn't sure. People were like, I'm not sure that's their work on for us. We we'll gonna see and work fine. So I was pretty happy about that. And then I came to painting. And one of the things I would really enjoy doing is building it up. You know, you got your, your strategy on weathering is you, you almost gotta do it like how is it gonna happen on the real world? Okay. Um there's two strategies here. You can go with a um a dry brush, dry brush method where you can get your effects by dry brushing the model, which is the very top of the method, been around forever. Or the other one, which I prefer, is the um, hairspray method, where you put down your base color, you hairspray over that, you let it dry, then you put your top color. So in this case, I primed it with black, Put my rust on in areas basically on pictures from Don Ball's photography of M1s around the Rockville Bridge. You notice, if you look at the photo, you'll notice that the front area obviously is going to get more rust. It's just getting exposed to a lot more you know, dirt, just, you know, almost like sandblasting going down the main line. And then you use local, and then I started putting that grime over on top of the hairspray. So you let it dry. And then you take water, a cup of water, and a nice flat square brush, and you start just applying. You start taking this brush. Has anybody ever done this? Cool. So you start taking it, and you just brush it. And as that water will go in and attack the hairspray, and the hairspray like wise by is used, you can go anywhere and get it, and it will. That water will pack that acrylic hairspray and pull it off. So now you're getting a very realistic effect. You're getting like rust, like the, the paint has come off the frame, it's been exposed, and now it's rusty. Looks wonderful, and I have it, and I'll show it to you in a second. But in what, what it does, it gives you a very realistic look and a very, like, it's a one off. I mean, it's, you could do it five different times, and you're going to get five different results, which makes it very nice.
So again, here's a, here's a tender being primed. Me. I didn't say that. And you said you think that was a base prime. Now it's a little cheap here. Yeah. This is a good question, but why did you decide to use like black, black primer, not, not gray? So when you paint, you use a like black primer. How do you want to see like when you go to paint it? Yep. You know what I mean? How do you want to see what a paint is compared to a black primer? Yep. That was a decision not to use gray primer. Then it happened. <laughs> but that's good. And there is a strategy on how you, what primers you use. Um, you can use a light primer if you know you're going to go to a dark color. So you can have a little like, <clears throat> like I just did a series of, uh, my Milan Club did a series of uh, builds for the Pacific Ocean, the uh, Pacific War in 40, uh, 42. So we had Midway, we had Coral Sea. If you go back and look at those pictures, you can see that they are, those airplanes are being just pelted with sink, uh, salt and it's pulling off that paint. So like you really want to go with like a, uh, a light primer, then put the, the navy blue on top, real light, real transparent to give it that effect. And you could do it here. And I'll show you what I did. Because one of the things I, I picked up in my research was that tenders will condensate. You'll see condensation on the tender from you know, temperature and everything going on. So the technique on that is we call pre shape and that's why I went with black now. If I wanted to emulate the water effects of the tender, so you're going to have that contrast. So I want the black on the back, the white or gray to kind of give it that water effect. If you look at the picture, you'll see streaks and on the ribs. One of the things about was neat about this model, the rivet, the rivet detail. Now, this model was probably done in 1965. What's you know, it's 50, 60-year-old model. And it's really amazing how much detail they put into it. Yeah, and I see why they were so popular back then, because you couldn't get that injection moment at all. And that today we are definitely getting into that in 3D printing for sure. But so you do like you focus on where it's gonna get light. Obviously, top of the sun's gonna sun's gonna hit that. The um, um, fire box there, the fireman's uh, section there. What do you call that? Oh, What's that? Doghouse. Dog house, thank you. The doghouse, you know, obviously the patch is for the water going in. It's going to be, they have a different shade to it. Street. So, <clears throat> you do is appreciating the technique using scale. Darken the areas of the miniature before applying the main color, which is the um, main color is being, I'm trying to, I'm working on the, wa on the water condensation. It can create an illusion of depth and map where light and shadow will be. So I'm working on a contrast here. And this is not mine, but this is what I want to pick up off the internet. And you can see it here. You can see that contrast. Now, some of that, I can tell, is a little bit of dry brushing where he went with a very, like that brown. He probably took a brush and then dipped in a little paint, took a, a towel, really clean that. So it didn't have much paint, but enough that when it was any bright raised surface, it would pull the paint off the brush and give you that effect. It'll come off. <clears throat> so, back to the chassis. One of the neat, the fun things was, and took a lot of time, was through Northwest Short Line, you, you replace these springs. And they offer three set of springs. They have a step, a medium, and a light. And there's a whole strategy on how you want to do that. And where you want your stiff springs are and where you want light. So I want a strategy of probably want the lighter ones in the front to allow the train kind of ride and step on the ones where the, the, the gear is set. So I have a good adhesion on the track. So, and then there's a lot of different strategies and I'm not sure if I'm doing it right, but it was fun playing with that and kind of messing with that. And you know, they can pop right in, they fit with a little grease in there. And it was just a neat little process. So here's a no, I'm sick area. I'm sorry. I do live in Binghamton, New York. So once I get, yeah. Um, but here, like, I, I, I like this photo. Yeah, research. We got the books. We got the you know technical. You know, we got all our club stuff. But the internet is so much up there, obviously, and with the phones. Well, what caught me on this picture was I was able to see a little bit of that streaking. You can see the shading. But this is someone took this photo, and you're seeing more of this now. And digitally enhanced it. 
Now, this most likely, I, I was in with a black movie. Someone went in there, digitally enhanced it, and did a good job. I mean, it, I, mean I would say that a relatively accurate coloring or uh, uh, animation of that locomotive. And it's a really good source of, you know, you can see, like I said, every steam engine is going to weather the same in the Northeast. You know, it's all going to be the same. You can see the trailing trucks, you can see the streaking, you can see like, you know, the shading of the, the boiler. And that's all just, to me, that's, that's fun. That, that's really a lot of neat things to try to pull off and, and try to get that effect. And then down here, we're blessed with having, we can go and actually see the real thing. You know, obviously we got the Pete's Bay Railroad Museum, um, how many people have been out to Steam Town lately? Their inventory is It's unbelievable what they're doing up there. And uh, it's all free. <laughs> Steam Town's free. You can walk in there and walk around. And some areas they have cordon off, but I mean, that picture was taken at their roundhouse and they have like a catwalk. And you can get right up to the engines and you can take good pictures and you can see detail and you can just see, you know, just, and it's, it's really a nice resource to have in our backyard. So another fun thing to do when, you, when you're dealing with an old brass model is measuring it up. Um, I'm sure we all have it. Most people folks have that. The go-to is by Lenny Westcott, the Cyclopedia. I have one that brought it, 1960 version. <clears throat> you just kind of measure it up. Probably this model is relatively accurate. What I did pick up was the sand dome looked to be off a little bit. Um, Steam dome looked to be okay. It looked like it kind of fell in line on the back end. But you know, this model was made in Korea. So how they got the information back in the 1960s from whoever here to over there. I'm sure there was had to be some communication problems, some translation issues. So I'm sure probably if I get a newer model, it's probably more accurate. But just you know, it's neat. Take the tender. Now you can see here's a going back to the pre-shading. You can see where I'm kind of working on that, working on that. But we can see where the cold box is relatively accurate. You can see that the it actually looks like the tender was a little better done than the local one itself. But the tender looks he asked me right on to uh the encyclopedia there. That was fun. So making a headline. That was a that was an interesting challenge. I went through, I went to hobby stores, I went to train, uh, you know, train uh, shows, looking for little lenses to make up. But then you got to come out with a kind of lens that's going to fit that canister. So thank God for YouTube. <laughs> Someone came up with an idea, showed an idea of taking your acrylic, acrylic, uh, acrylic from a scale model, particularly like an airplane. And you have these frets. You cut one off. You heat it with a little like lighter, or you know, just like a big lighter. You get one off, and then you press it on a metal ruler. Did a couple times. Perfect. Absolutely fell in. Perfect. Then you just kind of trim it, you sand it, and you have a lens. It was amazing how easy it turned. And then be careful how you heat it, but the trick is having a very flat square ruler that you can just take it, and once you see it heating up enough and softening it, you can press it down. And what happens is it will kind of mushroom out. So as you press this down, this becomes narrower, and the lens kind of widens out like a mushroom. So then you can fit it into your canister, and it looks like it's built for it. Really yeah. Did you press it between two metal rollers? No. Your finger? Uh, tweezers. Scissors. Yep, just tweezers. I used that tweezers. Like tweezers right there. I held it and I just pressed it right down, kept it like, you know, kept it to a 90 degree angle. And you, it literally became like a little mushroom and it fit right in there. And you trim it. Now you have a bulge. You have a bulge coming out from the canister, which is not realistic. So you just take some sanding paper and you just kind of start washing it over it and you keep on working down and you wet sand it. And you'll never, you would never know yet. You, you trimmed it. It looks perfectly fair. So that worked out really well. Now, the one was challenging was mounting the motor. 
You know, the original motor was, the electric motor was screwed in. Obviously, that's not going to happen with these little can motors. So I went, you got silicone. And you just kind of, then my challenge was, how do I make sure I'm not going to have, you know, it's going to be mine, it's not a problem. So I went with the rubber, the rubber shaft and just kind of played with that and kind of ran it. You know, kind of just made sure everything's working. Work on it. Okay, run it now. So I'm still tweaking on the on the quartering of the last driver there, but you know it works just fine. And uh, so much quieter. Um, it's it's, it's going to be a beautiful motor. You know, once I might get the DC hooked up, it's going to be just really neat. Did, did you end up quartering all the drivers? No, I was lucky that I didn't have to quarter any. Anyway. Um, they were all fine. The gearbox was fine. I was able to. I didn't hear any clicking, and, and I'm just right now. My struggle is on the last driver. I got these all in line, working fine. And so I'm challenging right now. I'm getting that flexibility. I'm getting a little bind on it right now, so I'm working through that. So someone asked if you could zoom in on the ruler. What on the ruler that was in the previous slide? They just wanted to see it closer up. So it's a metal roller. Okay. Just uh, what's involved in like quartering the drivers? Like, what, so you take the model apart and then you go to put the drivers back in. They're going to be out of sync with each other. I mean, like, what's that? Like, yeah. What's wrong with that? That was learning curve right there. So I don't understand the physics, but. You have the, the where they they drive where the drivers are, they have to be at twenty five percent difference from one side to the other side. I'm glad you could speak up because I'm learning this as we go. And if you don't get it, it will bind. So you kind of you've got to like mark them and you got to kind of rotate. Now I I have a quartering tool, uh, Northwest Shortline. Thank God has one. They have a little quartering tool. I for a while I thought I'd bring it out, but I was able just to get enough. Shift in it, it must have just move on the, on the axle a little bit that I was able to get away with it. And my, my initial strategy was do one side and then do the other side. You can't do that, you have to do both at the same time. You almost like, and so my strategy became starting from the front and just working my way back. So, um, it's a hit and miss. Now, if you have to take change the gearbox, I think it's a you know, you're dealing with a whole that's a very involved project. Um, so if you're buying, buying brass, really the, besides the model being in good shape, the next thing is the gear itself. And you see that makes, looks right and feels right because if you have to take that out, this project has gotten much more complicated. And uh, eventually I'll tackle that, but I'm in a rush. I think, any feedback? Yeah, what I was just going to say is that putting the motor in, one of the problems with ordering has always been the four racks on the last one. I think that's what exactly what I'm dealing with right there. You have to put on, you put it back in, you got to put each of the drivers in the same in the same slot location or it doesn't really matter. Oh, no. so, man, you have to put in the same location. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. So you got to really, so like any documentation, camera. take a lot of pictures. Okay. Stripper camera works. By the way, that's why I leave it to the expert over there. <laughs> I'll, I'll, please, I mean, if I'm doing anything wrong, let me know. Good. Yeah. Uh, these, this is a, it looks like a fuel line, if you ask me. It's a really hard rubber, like a fuel line. And you just kind of go over the main shaft of the gear and the main shaft of the gear. And then that just gives you a connection. And it, it, it's a solid. Now, probably over time, it will wear out. I'm, just, I'm assuming that in 10 years, we run the engine a lot. If I have to go back in there and change it out. Um, but it just kind of replaced because you, you're not going to get that angle. You know, you, you can, obviously with drive on, you got to keep them in phase. So if you have a U joint in each end, that brings in a whole other series of issues you got to deal with. So this kind of just take away that issue of having two yolks uh, yoke in phase. Um, I don't know if you, you dealt with that. I use a surgical tube. There you go. And the harder plastic. Softer. You so you have a little play on it? Oh yeah. So the surgical tubing sorry. 
it's flexible. Okay. So I don't, I was wondering if you go with, so yeah, like when it starts, so you have a little coasting, so there's a little bit of delay when the locomotive takes off. No, 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 no. 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 This is direct time. Okay. It's just not hard to, it's. We'll talk there, okay. Good. But I do. Mm -hmm. It's cool. like that shit. Box it, yeah. But it, it, it helps with the alignment of the motor so it's secure. Yep. Yeah. It gives you a little, a little bit more. So going back to the um, mm -hmm. chipping, this is the product. This product, it's my wife. Hey, don't give me some hairs, but I had no idea what I need. So she came back. This is this has been around forever. So one of the things you got to do, obviously, you're dealing with a relatively small model. I'm not going to take this can and spray it. It's going to make a mess. So I um, decanted it out of a little, you know, a little straw. Go into a little cup, cover it, you know, a little glass cup with a cap. Spray it in there, let it breathe, let it just kind of get gases out of it for like 24 hours, pretty much takes a day. And then you can throw that through your airbrush. And you put that into your airbrush, and then you can just kind of, instead of just hitting the model all, you can just focus on where you want to have this effect. <clears throat> and, and again, you can you see the rust, you can see the, the paint layers. I mean, it just really brings out a nice effect. I mean, it looks great. Right. Like exactly what it will look like. I mean, Pay for me <clears throat> off the tracks now. Changing subjects when you're doing scale modeling, when you're doing painting, you know, you if you're modeling, you can do whatever you want, but you want if it has to be just it has to have logic, you gotta look at it with logic, okay? And you gotta say realism. I mean, we, 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 are, I think we all strive for realism. Here's an airplane, German World War II. This particular model was 1944, beautiful model. I don't know the model. It's gorgeous. Look how weathered it is. Okay? These planes didn't last long enough to get weathered. <laughs> they were made. They were thrown up in the air. They were facing a thousand bomber fleet with P-51s. They didn't last two days if they were lucky. And that's, that's a proven fact. So, this is a pet pee. You know, I mean, it's your mom, but not, I think when, if the story makes sense, it looks better. Beautiful model, but this doesn't make sense. These planes didn't last that long. They were shut down. So the goal is to take these models that have been sitting around forever and make them look and getting on the railroad and making them on. And the history of scale modeling can be traced back to ancient Egypt when wooden models, the mammals and boats, and chariots were made. Leonardo da Vinci also created scale models of paddle boats, catapults, and robots. To protect the local groups. So it's a, a skill that's gone back to civilizations. It's neat. It really kind of just relaxing. It's so much fun. We, we are blessed with so much material to go to with all the railroad photography. Do you think the technology they had, these guys were skilled. I mean, they were traveling around heavy equipment trying to get there, taking beautiful photography. So it's, a, it's just a, we can put that all together. They can make beautiful models. And uh, any questions? Any questions? Well, thank you so much. I offered something. Thank you, man. Hey, Ed. Where are you in the project now? Oh, yeah. Is there any online comments also? Hey, Russ, this is uh, Greg Wasopoulos. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. So I just want to comment on a couple of things. First of all, Ed, I, I love the presentation. Actually, I have this model sitting in my basement right now that needs to be painted. So, so timely. Um, your Aquanet technique is <laughs> interesting. I'd love to chat with you more about that. And, yeah. um, you know, definitely just want to get your contact information, maybe your email and a couple other things just to answer to the team. Regarding the quartering, you have to quarter it because as the steam goes into the steam cylinder, if it's not quartered, you're not going to be able to develop enough steam to move the locomotive. And lastly was uh, the gearing ratio. I actually did a Bowser M1 many years ago and love the fact that the um, Northwest Short Line is still around. I think the products are awesome. And I ended up putting a 36 to 1 gear ratio in that in order to give it more pulling power and a more realistic speed at, at full throttle. But um, again, great presentation. Thank you so much.
Well, thank you. Appreciate it. Um, the model is right there. It's a work in progress. Help yourself look at it. The tender is done. I got the decals on. And then you can, and then the, the boiler is, is prime, but the lower half you can see where the weathering is done. So with lights on, it should look a little better. Thank you. Any other questions? Basically, do you want to try to hold that up to the camera? Sure. Oh. Yeah, if we can, yeah. if Ed, if I can get your email address too, just want to uh, circle back with you on on the yeah. sidebar and uh, maybe get some more detailed photos and talk to you more. Yeah, I can hook you guys up. Awesome. Thanks, Russ. You know if this has a left hand leash already for the wheels? Yes, it does. Does it look like a little hiccup on the bottom? No, 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 no. I mean, like, in the quartering of the drive with most railroads, most American railroads use the right hand leash. The Pensy, in true form, did not follow what the other railroads did. They used the left hand leash. So, whereas most railroads, if, like, if it was straight up, the left side would be quartered. The, the right side would be quartered to be on the like head. It. The Pensy was the reverse of that. So they were a left hand lead. And gotcha. most models don't. So I was just curious. Be that was definitely the, not the Pensy way. It was left. It was the right hand then, right? You're saying? No, Pensy used left hand lead. Okay. The most American railroads used the right hand lead. This is right hand lead. Okay. Yeah. And, and both of the models were. <laughs> so. Yeah. So something I've only ever tackled on one because I had to replace the motor. Yep. Otherwise, yeah. What's the kind of set book? Brand of paint you want to use for the finish coat? Scalp coat? They're out of business, right? Is that the one last I heard? Yeah, I, I had seen like, some rumblings that someone else. They're a plastic bottle. I, I meant to take a picture. I'm so sorry. I thought about that. Yeah, tomorrow. Yeah. The last I had seen online, someone else was trying to acquire them, but I haven't seen anything from them. Because scale coat is the Brunswick green on the tender. And again, I used the Gunze. Um, the Gunze thinner, which is 11, it's, a, it's called 400 11 week thinner. It's unicorn tears. I mean, it, it's amazing. It doesn't do well with acrylic. And I'm not a big acrylic. Um, but the, the, they're enamel. It just, it, it, and I, I took it because where I bought it, the guy says, well, you know, he's blowing it out. He goes, well, there's there's no thinner for it. And I'm thinking, I need that lovely thinner. It's just a, it's a hot lap. And, you know, I can lap. And, and it just went I And mean, that was done Monday. And he just came right in. And, you know, I still got some work to do on it. I still got some soldering to do, uh, particularly on the back marker lights I put on. Um, it's just a challenge. I mean, the soldering, the soldering has been by far the very frustrating part of this process. It's just, I've done, I've tried multiple times and now I'm going to keep on practicing. I bet you'll have to do it. So, I bring mine. He's a he's big grass model. That's still a little lady. He's a big, uh, he's got a whole resistor fire from set. Yeah. Uh, he said he's, he does a lot of side of the ranch. You know, they got to have a resistor side of it. The resistor side of it gets him down to eat the TV. Quickly, right. Let me just end this because you guys can still talk. Okay, so we're gonna uh, end the Zoom portion of the meeting because uh, we're starting to have lunch here. I think you guys are gonna have trouble hearing. Uh, so thank you, man. Awesome presentation. Fit right into what we're looking for.